I'm going to do uh, kind of what we did last time I was teaching. Uh, we're going to look at the life of Elijah. This will be the part two. If you do have your Bibles, we're going to jump into, let's see, 1 Kings chapter 18. While y'all are turning there, I'm going to give a brief recap of what we really covered last time because I know it was loaded last time. First, we looked at the beginning of the life of Elijah. We noticed how he went and to the king and he declared a message that was from God that there wasn't going to be any rain or dew for a period of time. We uh, got to talking about how it was going to affect everything. It was going to affect all the people, all the animals, all the crops. It was going to affect everybody. You'd have people probably dying, people losing lots of weight that would have been suffering during that big drought. Then we looked at the birds. We saw how the Lord used the birds or the ravens to take care of Elijah. It was a Amazing provision from the Lord. It was supernatural. It wasn't natural for the ravens to go and bring this man food twice a day, every day. And he drank from a brook of water for a period of time. After that, we looked at the bread. It's where he went to the widow's house, and uh, the Lord used her to be able to feed him and her entire family for what I believe to be around three years. It was a blessing. The widow, she wasn't surprised whenever... The uh, prophet showed up. She had been warned before time, and we also noticed that she was willing to listen to what the Lord had to say. After that, we looked at the breath. We could see whenever her son, whenever he had died, that she had went to him. Her heart was broken. It was grieving. She thought it was a judgment because of some great sin that she had done in her life. Then by the end of it, we see how that he had brought the son back to life which was a miracle. I believe that was the first time we'd seen anybody brought to life throughout the scriptures. Following that, we looked at the boldness, how he went to the king the second time. This wasn't to say that there was the drought. This was to basically go up to him and say, I'm going to challenge all the prophets of Baal. Then we looked at the burnt offering, which was interesting. We can see most people are familiar with this one where he challenges all the prophets of Baal into basically a duel where... They're going to see whose God is the one and true God. The one that is, he's going to send fire down and consume the sacrifice that they had built up. We've seen how they was getting on the altar. They was making a fool and a mock of themselves. And Elijah, he was just back there. He was laughing at them because he knew that if their God was really going to send fire down from heaven, they wouldn't have got anywhere near that altar. By the time everything's said and done, we see how he had a very brief prayer and fire fell down and consumed the altar, consumed the water. Uh, I believe it also consumed the rocks as well. Now we're going to look at the bountiful rain. I know I briefly mentioned this, but I wasn't able to read the verses last time. Chapter 18, verses 41 through 46. It says, So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast down himself, or cast himself down upon the earth, and put his face between his knees. And said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. 45. And it came to pass in the meanwhile, that the heaven was black with clouds and the wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Here we have, we can look at the bountiful rain. We knew, or he knew, that the rain was well on its way. But we also couldn't help but notice that this rain, it didn't show up until after the Lord had basically declared judgment on the prophets of Baal. He had went through, they had slain all the prophets of Baal right after the burnt offering, right after that sacrifice. And we can read in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. It says, Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, and the land perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. That's the end of that verse. But, like I said, I want you to notice that this was a promise in the Old Testament that if they had went and turned from God, 
they have started serving the other gods, the gods of the land, that the Lord, who's going to pronounce judgment? And this may not sound like much to you, but just imagine if, even here in America, just imagine the consequences if we didn't have any rain. Think about all the people that would be suffering that would go through hunger. We wouldn't be able to have the crops that we have. The food that we have stored up in our freezers, it wouldn't last for long periods of time. The grocery stores, it would run out. They would be a mess. Now, I want you to notice that promise, it can be directly towards America just as well as it was towards Israel at that time. The Lord, He can pronounce that kind of judgment even to us today. He can shut up the heavens that it doesn't give it rain. It's a miracle that the Lord doesn't just call His children home now. Sometimes I question, Lord, why haven't you came yet to see how wicked this world's getting, how the people are turning away from God? But we notice that He went to the top of Mount Carmel and His servant was with Him. I couldn't help but notice this morning when I was kind of rereading it, the name of the servant in this story is not given. It doesn't tell who it is. Now, I wasn't able to find anything to even suggest who it might be. We know it wasn't Elisha because he hadn't been called out yet. We don't know who it was, but we do know that he was told to go look seven times toward the sea. But I couldn't help but think about the blessing, though, that seventh time whenever he was sent again, how he finally saw a cloud. I believe he said the cloud was in the shape of a man's hand. Let's see if I can find it real quick. If y'all find it for me, just holler. Is it 43? 44. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Couldn't help but think about the promise that he had went to go talk to Ahab once again. And just the thought, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Could you imagine how strong and how heavy that rain would actually be to be able to bog up a chariot? I imagine he might have had horses pulling it, but the rain would have been so bad if he hadn't have prepared his chariot in time, he would have stopped that chariot in its tracks. Just imagine how the dark clouds must have been coming. I imagine that there would have been big thunderstorms coming up. Imagine the wind would be kicking up greatly. That would, I imagine that would cause great fear and at the same time, it may cause great excitement just to know that the Lord sent rain. Great fear, and it's almost like you're starting to see judgment. You have all these thunderstorms coming up. The clouds are getting dark. The wind's kicking up. You see the trees swaying back and forth. That would have caused fear. But then just think about how great that rain would have been. It talks about it in verse 45. It's exciting in one instance to know that they hadn't had rain in what I believe to be three and a half years they would finally have some fresh water come down from heaven. It would finally start to nourish up the ground. They would be able to have some fresh drinking water that they probably hadn't had in a long time. It gives hope when they think about their crops. They'll be able to actually have some, have gardens again. They'll be able to grow food to help nurse themselves. But at the same time, it would have been a rough storm. I imagine that it would have washed a lot of ground away. Like I said, there was a warning to the king that says, They have prepared thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. After that, let's look at the chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. Here we can look at the belief. It says, And he had told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with, with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not my life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel 
touched him, said unto him, Arise and eat. Here we noticed how Elijah, he had gotten so discouraged, so down and out, and it's, it's humbling to realize that you have Elijah. He had just performed all these amazing miracles. He got to see just how much the Lord was actually willing to do and be able to use him to do all these miracles. But he still got discouraged. Let's notice that nobody's above getting discouraged. Nobody's above getting depressed. <coughs> doesn't matter who you are, how brave a man you may be. He got discouraged. There's a couple things that he did that uh, couldn't help but notice first. It's like he got the news that Jezebel basically was wanting to kill him. He probably did have fear for that. He had fear of his life. I, I understand that. We want to live. We don't want to die. But also, it's like he found himself by himself. He left his servant. I believe it said he went a day's journey. Yeah, verse 4 says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He was by himself. He didn't bring the servant that he had with him. He went by himself. I want you to notice it's hard to encourage yourself when you're alone. It's always easier when you have somebody there with you to encourage you to keep doing right. It's not always going to be easy. That's the sad fact. It won't always be easy. <laughs> but we can't encourage ourselves easily. He was ready to give up. Like I said, even after seeing everything that he had done in the past, how he had saw the blessings of the Lord on his life, he had saw how that when he told King Ahab that there was going to be a drought, there wasn't going to be any rain or dew, that it happened. He got to see how he was fed by the birds. He got to see how the meal and the oil didn't run out for what appears to be a couple of years. We can look at how he revived the widow's son. We can see how no rain came until he basically went back to the king after the Lord told him, go tell him that the rain's coming. We've seen him prove that God is the one true God whenever he sent fire down to consume the sacrifice. He knew who the one true God was. You would think that he'd be excited just to think about everything that he had done in the past. Think about how the Lord had greatly used him. But instead of being excited, he was, in his moment of weakness, he got alone. He went and sat under the juniper tree. And he was ready to die. He might have had the thought, I've lived a good life. He's gotten to see what it was like to be on the mountaintop. But the thing is, between every two mountaintops, there's always a valley in between. There's always something that can get us discouraged. Sometimes it's circumstances of life. Sometimes it's something to do with family, something to do with friends, or something just gets you discouraged. Sometimes it feels like you have your heart ripped out because of something. And I want you to know there's a God up in heaven. He knows exactly what each and every one of us are going through. He knows exactly what we need, and He knows exactly when we need it. Right. We'll look at the uh, baked cakes from the Lord. I believe that's verses 6 through 7. It says, And He looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at His head. And He did eat and drink and laid Him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched Him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. I want you to notice that. This was from the Lord. The Lord had ended up feeding him at least two times what we, what we can see right here. I don't know. It might have been manna from heaven. I can't prove it one way or the other. But I couldn't help but wonder if it's the Lord Jesus Christ bringing it to him. It probably was. I can't prove that without a shadow of a doubt. But also notice that even after the Lord fed him those two times, he was able to go on that those meals for... 40 days, we can read that in verse 4. It says, in, or not 4, verse 8. It says, And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. I got to thinking yesterday whenever I was looking at this, there's only three people for sure that I know went without eating and drinking for 40 days and nights through the scriptures. The first, you have Moses, whenever he went up to the mountain for the Ten Commandments. This was in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 9. It says, When I was going up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. 
But what I was reading, some believe that Joshua was there, that he didn't eat or drink bread as well. I don't know. I can't prove it one way or the other. But I can almost see that happening as well. The second one that we know for sure is right here in Elijah. It says, verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Verse 8, And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Then you have the third one that it went without eating and drinking for forty days and forty nights. This was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We can read that in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward a hunger. He was able to go on the strength of this bread and water, given directly from the Lord himself for at least those 40 days and 40 nights. This wasn't just spiritual food either, but I'm sure that the Lord has fed him many times, especially through his ministry. We just, like I said, we've talked about it a couple of times already this morning, about how the Lord had greatly used him with all these miracles. But I couldn't help but notice that it didn't just stop there. We can look at the bold voice in Chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. Make sure I read that right. Verse 9 says, And he came thither into, unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, Where dost thou, What dost thou hear, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even not only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 11, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice and it was so when elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave and behold there came a voice unto him and said what doest thou hear elijah and he said i have been very jealous for the lord god of hosts because the children of israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword and i even i only am left and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahala, I could be pronouncing that wrong, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword shall Jehu, sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. We'll stop reading right there. We notice that he comes to the mountain, to the cave, basically where the Lord had wanted him to go. We see how the Lord had spoken with him. He gave him a rebuke. First, we, we can see how the winds, how they came out and they broke up the mountains into smaller rocks. Then after that, we see how there was an earthquake that followed. And after that, you've seen a fire. It seems like after all this noise and commotion, then you have this still, small voice that can be heard. We can look at how he began to we could see him reverence whenever he decided he was going to cover, him, cover his face. I don't know if he just realized that how low that he was, that he was just a man. He wasn't anything special. I don't know. I can't say beyond a shadow of a doubt. But I almost couldn't help but notice if he realized that he really wasn't worthy to be able to talk to the Lord face to face. I couldn't help but notice in verses 10 and 14 they read almost exactly alike. There's only one word that changes in it. Uh, one is 
one of them says for, and the other, it changes for to because. The rest is pretty much identical. We'll read it and I'll show you. It says, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. We'll look at verse 14. It says, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because, that's the change, the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Which notice that this is him basically giving his heart. His heart's breaking. He's seeing Israel, the people, the Jews. He's seeing how they're turning their face away from God. They broke down his altars. They're serving other gods now. They're, they don't have the reverence and respect for the Lord God anymore. They're willing to go about and serve any God that they want to. They don't have the reverence and respect of God anymore. Then we look in verse 15 how he commanded, how he was commanded to anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Then verse 16, I believe it was 16, yeah, it says, And Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat, basically he was to anoint him to be prophet. But what I can tell, this was the very first time that we see Elisha mentioned in the scriptures. Elisha doesn't show up in the picture until late in the following chapter. That's the first time we actually see Elijah or Elisha show up. But in verse 18, we can almost see the condemning of Elijah. It says, Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. I say that it's uh, almost a uh, condemning because he thought that he was the only servant that was still serving God. Could you imagine just the pride to be able to go and say that I'm the only one serving God? The pride that he must have had. To really think that he was the only servant of God that wasn't willing to not bow in the bell. But we see that God's like telling him that you're not the only one that's serving him. There's still over 7,000 that still haven't bowed the knees to Baal. The blessing of that, knowing that he wasn't the only one that still serving God anymore. There were still other people serving God. Next we're going to look at the bringing up of Elijah. We can see how that he was sent to anoint, anoint a king first, but then he was told to go anoint the prophet. I didn't write those verses down. Right, verse 19 says, So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then will I follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? Verse 21 says, And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave them to the people, and they did eat. Then he arose, and went after Elijah, and ministered unto him. Right here is the bringing up, or in other words, it's the training up of Elijah, or Elisha. Could you imagine that you're being trained up by this great prophet, Elijah? Just imagine. You've heard about the fame, you've heard about all the miracles that he's been able to perform, and you get to be able to basically sit under his feet and learn from all the mistakes, all the things that he has been through. Just imagine that. But before Elisha was willing to go with Elijah, he wanted to make sure that he took care of his household first. He had took the oxen, he had killed the oxen, he had made sure that his family was fed before he was willing to go on and glean and learn everything from Elijah. Such a blessing when you really see that. But even how that appears, even today, it's like I get to see it firsthand because I'm a young preacher, how the pastor, he's kind of pulled you to the side and he's training you. He's showing you, he's like, I read this book, read this. You can learn things from here. He 
shows you how to make the outlines. He shows you, basically you have the pastor just taking you under his wing and just trying to show you how to be able to serve and some of the, give the advice and encouragement on how to be better, how to be the better servant, be a better preacher, teacher, whatever it may be. There's so many aspects that in the ministry that nobody thinks about. You don't see all the time that you have the preacher there reading, they're seeking God's face, they're trying to improve on the delivery, they're trying to pray, they're seeking God's face, they're seeking the Lord's will, they're praying about a message that the Lord's trying to lay on their heart. They're, there's so much that goes into it that nobody thinks about until you actually kind of get pushed on into the ministry. You don't see the heartbreak that goes on in the life of the preacher. You don't see it. But I couldn't help but notice, I know I'm skipping myself just a little bit, you have a, Elisha, he was there all the way to the end. I'm going to hit that briefly towards the end, I hope. But after that, we can behold judgment cast. It's in the First Kings chapters 21. Verse 17 through 29. I think I've got time to read it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In this place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Verse 20, And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahiah. For the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel, him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard these words, that he rent his clothes, and put sackcloth upon his flesh, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went softly. And word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. Here we see basically the judgment that's cast. You have Elijah, he's coming up to him after that his wife had basically talked him into basically killing the man so that he could get the vineyard. He was whining, he was crying, he really wanted this vineyard. So he goes to his wife, he tells her all about it, and then she goes basically behind his back and sets up people to murder him so that he can come and lay hold of this vineyard. But part of the judgment that I couldn't help but notice is how his bloodline will be completely purged by Jehu. This is in 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. It says, And it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, Ye be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. But who slew all these? Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which he spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. Verse 11, So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, and all, this great, all his great men and his kinfolk and his priests, until he left him none remaining. This was where we can see the fulfilling of the prophecy, how everybody that was in his family was going to be slain. But we notice how when he humbled himself when he heard the news in verse 27. I believe that's what it took to really get a hold of his heart. To realize that there was going to be judgment because of what had happened. 
That's what it took. I hate to wonder what it's going to take for the Lord to get a hold of our hearts when we get turned away sometimes. I hate to think about that. But the Lord knows exactly how to open up our eyes. For him, it was a threat of punishment, having his bloodline basically severed from Israel. But we notice that the mercy of the Lord was in verses, verse 29. It says, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring this evil. He passes the judgment on to a later generation. But if he wouldn't have humbled himself, I wonder if this wouldn't have happened within the same year. I hate to think like that, though. It would have been a very different story had he not humbled himself. It would have been in his lifetime for sure. But I imagine it probably wouldn't have been very long. Second, we're going to look in Second Kings chapter 1. We'll look at the burning armies. It's in verses 2 through 15. It says, And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet thy, the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is no god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed which thou art gone of, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man up to us to meet us. We'll try that again. Verse 6, And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou hast Thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to you, up to meet you, and told you these words? Verse 8, And they answered him, He was a hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to, the, to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king, hath said, Come down. Verse 10, Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven, and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven, and consumed him and his fifty. And again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. And again, or, and he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Verse 14, Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burned up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. We'll stop reading right there. Like I said, this is another one of those interesting stories where we can see how Elijah, how he's used once again even after he had gotten discouraged and depressed. You had the king of Israel, the son of Ahab. He had failed and he became sick. So he decided it would be a good idea to send messengers to go talk to a foreign god to find out if he was going to recover or not. Then the Lord, he sends Elijah, tells him to meet up with him and basically question, why are you going to turn to a false god when you've got the one and true god that you can talk to to find out if he, you're going to die or not? He lets him know that he will die. He's not going to come off this bed. 
So following this, you have the king, he decides it's gonna be a good idea. Let's go send a couple of armies after Elijah to bring him unto, bring him to him. Just imagine that you're on this hill. You've got the first band of soldiers. You've got 50 men that's there to try to take you to the king. He's just casual. If I'm a prophet of God, let fire come down from heaven. That's the first set. He does it again. Then you have a, the last captain. He's humble. He pleads for the lives of his soldiers that are under him. He had compassion. He cared for the people that he had under him. Then you have the Lord. He goes and tells him that he can go with this man. So he does. And then we see basically how the story is. We still know that he died according to the word of the Lord that the way Elijah had told him. We see that the Lord, how he greatly used him. They were finally at the final point. I know you're all so happy. Chapter 2, verses, we'll go 1 and 2, says, And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah unto heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were with that were at Bethel came forth to Elijah, or Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Elijah said unto him, Elijah, or Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And I believe it's verse 6. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they two went on. Verse 8. And Elijah took his mantle, and wrapped it together, and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither. And so they two went over on dry ground, and it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elisha, Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, behold, I'll be taken away from thee. And Elijah, Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. Verse 11, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind and into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah and fell from him, or that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Here we see the burning fiery chariot. Could you imagine that all of a sudden you're walking with somebody and all of a sudden you have a fiery chariot come down and take them from you and you never see them again. I imagine that would make a pretty awesome movie. All of a sudden you have somebody beside you and they're just took out from your sight in a fiery chariot. Just imagine that. And all this time he's, you have a Elisha and Elijah, they're having fellowship. Elijah, he's serving God all the way to the very end. I couldn't help but notice that. He kept getting sent to other places. We also know that he knew that this was going to be his last day on earth. It was multiple times the sons of the prophets, they knew that he was going to be taken because they went to him two times. It was in verses 3 and 5. But he wanted to be there with him to the very end. He was given this promise if he saw him taken away that he could basically make this one wish, this one request, whatever he asked, it was going to happen. He wanted to have a double portion of the spirit of Elijah put on him. That's a big task. But I couldn't help but imagine the fellowship that they would have had all the way to the very end. I couldn't help but imagine that they might have been talking about some of his biggest regrets, some things that he would have done differently if he had known some of the things that he would have known. But here we see that Elisha, he was willing to stay with him to the very end. Just imagine the gleaning, the blessings that he would have gleaned from him just by being there to the very end. 
Didn't see that chariot of fire come down and take him. I don't believe there was every man that was taken away from the earth quite in this fashion. That'll be it. I'm going to dismiss this in a word of prayer.